much and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm a bit exhausted, but it's fine. We'll make that happen. And yes, it is still the Sol Kersner building and the sentiments of yesteryear will always remain, but yeah, we'll let it go this year. So today's conversation is focusing on the very, very difficult aspect of the entanglements between the corporate state and, you know, the big state itself. And I think when we reflect on what we learned from the Zonda Commission, what we learned from uh, the different testimonies that are there, it is very clear that the entanglements between the state and the private sector are quite complicated, and they will probably be here with us for a very long time. And it is also clear that in many instances, those particular entanglements do represent an, an opportunity for the rent seekers and all those other dodgy characters to then piggyback on those particular entanglements to then achieve their own nefarious means. But now that we've had the commission, now that we've had time to reflect, now that we've had time to breathe as a country, it is quite important for us to then figure out what happens next. And the two panelists who are joining me here are individuals who have not only followed this crisis from the beginning and also written extensively about it, but also have some very good ideas about what exactly needs to be done differently or better in order to ensure that the country that we all live in somehow manages these entanglements better going forward. So what I'll do first is first I'll ask them to give us some reflections on what we have uh, gone as a journey as a country since the first state capture hearings many, many years ago and where we are today, and also perhaps reflect on what the key disappointments or the key achievements have been since the report was released, if there are any. So I'll start with Claire Ballat, who is, of course, from Open Secrets, where she's the head of the legal unit. And if you know about Open Secrets, they have this habit of opening up the type of secrets that a lot of us didn't know still actually had to be unpacked. So they've done some wonderful work there. I've collaborated with them on trying to talk about the reforms that are necessary in the auditing sector. I don't know if, Claire, if we're getting there, but at least we've spoken about it, which is just a start. Over to you. Thanks, Kaya. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for this invitation. I'm going to start by saying that I think that any discussion around corporate or private sector accountability must have, it, have at its core criminal accountability. And that's not to say that any parallel system or of reparations should not be established. In fact, I think um, we would all be in favor of that. But it's my hope and indeed appeal that the role of the NPA and the investigative entities tasked with fighting corruption um, be at the forefront of, of any discussion. I say that because, Kaya, you said this, this last year, Zondo wasn't the first time we encountered economic and, and corporate greed. It's, it's been going on for a long time and no doubt it, it will continue. Long preceded the findings of the, of the Zondo Commission. And this impunity, because that's what it is, will continue unless we throw a very heavy spanner in the works. That spanner should be criminal findings of guilt. Because if, we, if what we see is large-scale impunity, then we must establish real and meaningful deterrence of crime, because it is crime, economic crime. And what we know about deterrence of criminal actions is that it is the surety of conviction that is the best predictor of crime prevention. That is not opinion I have or Open Secrets has. Um, it's the conclusion of decades worth of, of social science research into criminal justice and, and penal reform. I'm not saying anything new. Um, and I think this is well illustrated by a case in particular, and I'm going to talk here about uh, the role of McKinsey um, and how they featured in, in, the, in the Zondo Commission and then report. Um, I think it was a, a welcome event when in September last year, McKinsey were indi indicted with charges in relation to its role in corruption and theft at Transnet. We hope that their uh, role in, in, in similar offenses relating to ESCOM will be forthcoming. We don't know the status of the prosecution, um, but McKinsey's response is quite telling. Um, following the charges, and I'm going to summarize it um, in, in three, point, three, three points. They said, well, we paid back the fees we earned. Um, we didn't have to, but we did. Um, we gave you Vikas Sagar, who's conveniently no longer our employee. And quite frankly, Zondo didn't ask for anything more than that. And my response, again, is threefold. Um, 
this really just smacks of corporate responsibility rhetoric and quite frankly is insulting. It's also not true. Zondo said in his report that the role of McKinsey warranted further criminal and investigation. So what McKinsey said was just nothing less than a, than a misrepresentation of the truth. And company structures itself um, hold top structures accountable for all contracts concluded. Um, and if that weren't the case, why did they apologize and embark on what they called some internal reflection? Um, until we have corporate executives held responsible for theft and fraud, theft and fraud um, slapped with criminal records, we'll be holden to this kind of, I don't know, charity, pay back the money gestures which is just really another way that the, the tail is, is wagging the dog. Um, put differently, there are a number of distractions thrown our way. Um, I noted this morning, um, and we had the, uh, Mr. Tim uh, presenting to us um, the, the Office of the President's position, um, one of the action items was um, establish legislation is, uh, that uh, creates offences um, dealing with, um, what was the, the term, public, the abuse of power, um, public abuse of, uh, abuse of public power, I think was, was the word, and, and I'm really struggling with this one because there isn't an offence that already exists that I don't think um, accounts for what we've seen, money laundering, breaches of duties in terms of the PFMA, theft, corruption, it's all there. It's ready to be prosecuted. Um, what Zondo did was put a lot of this on record, and a lot of that is in, is in the public domain now. Um, let's look at Prasa. We're not succeeding. And of course, what Zondo did do was put a lot of, well, a string of 15 names before us, um, for which there is very persuasive evidence. Um, and the failure to prosecute is just more obvious to us, given what we know. Prasa itself initiated litigation compelling the Hawks to complete its investigation. Um, and this is where perhaps Ms. Johnson and I disagree, where as the prosecutor, you know, she is the final leg of, of an investigation of this, of this nature, because the ID is established in terms of a presidential proclamation. The ID exists within the location of the National Prosecuting Authority uh, legislation. Um, for that reason, and this is, this is very clear, it's a prosecution-led investigation. Um, and I think the papers filed by Prasa asking the Hawks, or asking the court to compel the Hawks to act is incredibly telling. It tells us in great deal the trajectory of that investigation. And what we see is this. Every time a new investigating officer is appointed, they start from square one. If you had a prosecutor assigned to that case right from the beginning, that wouldn't be the case. You'd have a sense of efficiency, knowledge of the law, accountability, a sense of permanence, etc. And we just don't have that. Um, and when Lieutenant General Libya of the Hawks appeared before the Zondo Commission in 2021, he assured the public, certainly in relation to um, corruption regarding the Siangena and Suivambo contracts, that the Hawks were 90% and 75% complete with their respective investigations. His silence over the last three years on that score is quite deafening, I believe. Um, that's not to say there isn't a need for legislative reform. I do believe that, that to be the case. Um, we can talk about the NPA, and indeed my colleagues have presented um, our submissions on the establishment of the Independent Directorate for, um, corrupt, uh, against corruption this morning, and a lot of what I'm saying now has been presented to the Portfolio Committee, and I would, I would encourage you to read our submissions on that because they are very, um, they're very comprehensive. Um, we look at the role of consultants. I mean, and we hope here that the indictment against, Mc, against McKinsey is, is not the exception to the rule because we know the role of Bain, um, BCG as well. Um, in that respect, 
I would argue that legislative reform is important. They've got large-scale multinational corporations um, existing in the, in the public sector space, making large-scale changes, and we know what those changes led to, in, certainly in respect of ESCOM, for example, and SARS. Um, unlike other professional body, bodies, accountants, auditors, lawyers, there isn't any regulatory legislation that provides for a complaints mechanism, for example, that you see with other professional regulatory systems. That, I would argue, is, is, a, is something that needs to be addressed. All the more so given that their bottom line is profit and not service delivery, and yet they're existing in the service delivery space. Um, money laundering. Um, there's, I've, I've seen argument relating to the money laundering framework perhaps not addressing um, the scenario of Nedbank and the Bank of Baroda, for example. I, personally, I think the FICA legislation um, should have addressed the malfeasance that we saw, but to the extent that it doesn't, we could revisit the money laundering, laundering framework. Um, but I hope the role of Nedbank remains in our collective conscious um, and that we, we don't have short memories on that score. Uh, the NPA, um, its top, its entire top structure, is appointed by the president and or the minister. Um, its budget is a line item on the Department of Justice. Um, and while the Constitution envisages a degree of executive involvement, because the text of the Constitution says that it is, that it is the Minister of Justice that exercises final responsibility over the NPA, that shouldn't uh, translate into what the NPA uh, legislation does, which is essentially provide for the top structure to be beholden to the president, not only in terms of appointment, but conditions of that employment, remuneration, um, the um, establishment of policy, for example. So whatever anti-corruption body we establish is going to be located in that framework. And we are bound by certain inter um, international treaty law that says that when that is the case, we need to look very, very closely at how we can address um, issues around structural, financial, and operational autonomy. Um, and there are various ways in which you can do that, creating separate hierarchies, ring-fencing ring budgets, uh, for example. But while it's a very positive move that um, a, a an anti, well, a corruption entity is firstly prosecution-led and secondly established in primary legislation, which means it doesn't have to rely on a presidential proclamation to exist. It's still located um, within, a, within an authority that is beholden to executive control. And I think we, we have to address that because if we care about deterrence, which we must, we must care about criminal prosecution, which means we have to care about the way in which our, our our prosecuting authority is, is capacitated. We need to listen to Mr. Motivi when he goes to Parliament and says the funding model is not working. When our NDPP addresses Parliament, and quite frankly, every year she puts it in the annual report to say that the fact that we are a budget, a, a line item on, on, justices depart, on, on justices' budget really, really hinders our capacity to fight crime, we really need to listen. Sometimes it feels Talking about the NPA, it really does feel like a, a failed project, but as long as there is large-scale impunity, we absolutely cannot let it go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end there, Kaya. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claire. A lot of questions emerge from what you're saying. Um, I can give you a hint. Um, whilst the <coughs> executives of the NPA and the prosecution's agencies are appointed by the president, the executive of the Public Protector's Office is appointed through a different process altogether and look at what happened. But we'll come back to that. <laughs> I, I, I want to say there's no magic in being a Chapter 9 institution. Nothing at all. Any magic that exists from being a Chapter 9 exists in the fact that there is structural, financial and operational autonomy. Mm. Those are magic words for me, not Chapter 9. We'll come back. Iraj, your perspectives? Um, thank you very much. Um, Thanks for the opportunity, and uh, I recognize it's the session after lunch, so it's difficult to, to be rational and to, to uh, so if I go off the rail, uh, it's not me, it's the effect of lunch. Um, and my perspective is really more of an economist. Um, I have 
uh, uh, no specific views on the legalities and I'm learning, but I do recognize the importance of law and regulation for any successful economy. So all of those are, whatever I say, is not a crit crit critique of, of the importance of law. If you ask the question, is our totality architecture of uh, regulation, institutional capacity, enforcement, and the speed with which we do and do not do things, is it able to keep corporates, private sector accountable? And the answer for me is absolutely not. Why well, am I so sure? Because over the past 10 years, the following has happened. We've been downgraded, and in no small measure, in no small measure, and I'm happy outside here to provide the technical uh, proof for what I'm, 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 I'm claiming here openly. In no small measure, a state capture had a major contribution to make to bring us from being above investment grade into uh, to currently three notches below junk grade. We've been gray listed. That in itself means that your regulatory system and the enforcement is just not good enough. What does gray listing mean? It means there's a lot of illicit financial flows, there's a lot of money that nobody knows who pays and who gets and how it goes, etc., etc. So that has happened. Our growth has come down from 4.5% to today, when the Reserve Bank says we're going to grow half a percent, we all say, thank God we are not going to recession. I, I want to cry, and I do cry inside. I do cry inside, and I'll tell you why I have to cry. And very importantly, the so-called state capture has destroyed all the institutional underpinning of a successful democratic order and a successful economy. From NPA to SARS, from ESCOM to Transnet, from every institution of the state, from the funds that used to exist in different agencies, they have been not just stolen, made sure that no capacity is there to rebuild it and to underpin the growth of the economy. And if you don't believe me, let me just give you a few numbers that in the media, we don't have to go beyond that. ESCOM was just given 250 billion rand to just survive. Transnet is asking for 150. SAA, Daniel, et cetera, et cetera, PRASA, they are added up, and back of envelope is 150. These are that are in the media. That's 550 billion rand. And then when we hear that with all the in interventions, we have managed to recover 5.4 billion, or 16 billion, or 12 billion, I also want to cry. Why? Because we have not, in my humble view, as an economist, not as a lawyer, not like any, as a social campaigner, as an economist, I do not believe as a nation we have grasped the magnitude of what has hit us. And how long will it take, if we go on the current trajectory, how long will it take, if ever, to recover a fraction of what is stolen and none of the damage that was done? Remember, we have two things. We have money that was stolen and the collateral damage that was done to our constitutional democracy. And these two have different values attached to them. Let's focus on what is indisputably stolen, 500 to 600 billion rand. And let's look at the ones that we know, and um, Advocate Johnson mentioned, A, B, and B, has paid 2.5 billion. I submit that if we look at the cabinet memo that approved the total cost and budget for Kusila and, and Madupi, it was 89 billion approved by the National Treasury. 89 billion has been increased to 335 as of yesterday and not finished. And we don't have electricity. We have disruption to our economy. So there is how I want to ask A and B and others, Hitachi and others, how the hell did you manage to get 89 billion to go to 330 billion? And you're prepared to pay 2.5 billion. As my daughter would say, da. <laughs> I don't understand it, but that's what they say. 
And the majority of those who suffer from the consequences of this action are in action, are the dot generation. Because they are the ones who don't know what has hit them. They look at their leaders, us, our parents and grandparents, to put it in perspective. I do not believe, and I'm saying it with the greatest humility and with greatest respect to everybody here and outside, that we need to have a discourse that puts squarely the question of accountability in proportion to the magnitude of what has been stolen and in the magnitude of those who have been the culprit and the magnitude of the impact that it has now and for our future generation. If we don't, the consequences from an economic point of view, not from a legal point of view. From the economic point of view are the following. Our government, irrespective of who the party that is either in coalition or in um, outright majority, whether right, left, or centered, the government is set to fail for the time being and for 20 years to come. Why? Because look at the debt ratio. Look at the growth. Look at the population growth and look at the broken infrastructure everywhere around you. From roads, potholes, from water availability, energy availability, rails, ports. Do I have to go on and on? So what are we having this discourse? Why is that we are not politically, socially, ethically locating the discourse properly and then finding solutions. Getting the long-term architecture of accountability law, uh, revising, upgrading the, the governing legislation of NPA, absolutely necessary, without a doubt. Capacitating our institutions with the right skills for the 21st century crime, absolutely indispensable. And may I put a footnote, I used to lecture and write academics, and put a footnote that when we talk about corruption and the state capture, corruption and the state capture by its biology, by its nature, mutates. It doesn't stay the same. Our corruption over the past 10 years, thanks to all that has happened, has mutated from a crude, politically driven state capture to the varieties, think of COVID, to the varieties that you can put 4B, 4C, 4D, and other numerical uh, variation. At the moment, the variety that is pervasive, even with all the commitments that the government has made, with all the attempts that corporates make in the corporate sector, enough has been said about the public sector, in the private corporate sector, corruption has mutated to a level of a variety that is way beyond what we're discussing so far about how to respond to it. And why is it doing that? Because the private sector corporates have learned that government's got no capacity for the foreseeable future. Marcus Huston is walking the streets. The executives of, of every state uh, enterprise is glorified, politicized, racialized. We can get away with it. And if it's a question of two billion, one billion, you know what? I'll provide for it because the payoff is so huge. And when I get caught, I will go the legal route. Remember, the corporates like the legal route because they can deduct it from their taxes, because they can hire the best uh, senior counsel and put our NPA and all the others under huge pressure for years to keep them busy. And media will also criticize NPA. You are ineffective. You are not putting orange and be fighting ourselves, whereas the thieves are busy stealing our uh, future. So that's the submission that I have. My request is let's have a serious discussion. What happened is not a normal case. We cannot deal with it in a normal way. It was extremely abnormal in the past 100 years as a student of economics and my standing here to be corrected that any country had a situation that we had, that the political leadership and the corporate leadership combined to rob the country, not of money, of capacity, of legitimacy, of brand. Does that make sense? Isn't that what we are fighting amongst ourselves now? Because we are disappointed with our brand. This is not what we want to be. And they, they made sure that SAA and ESCOM and Transnet, et cetera, et cetera, doesn't recover for the foreseeable future. If you want to have a Marxist perspective, we can also look at it. There was a conspiracy by the political elite and by the capitalists to make sure that the state fails so that they can do everything from delivering 
pension funds to student uh, uh, allowances to rail to uh, and you name it. You can have a Marxist perspective, but that's for the historian to explain. For you and I, the challenge is what do we do now that we've been robbed in the daylight? And I suggest, by way of ending, three things that we have to do. And these things are not alternatives. They got to be done together. They are complementary measures that I believe they require a different level of commitment, different level of political morality. One is what we've been discussing about. We've got to reestablish NPA and put all force the best that we can, um, the best of brain that we have to make our NPA long term as effective as it can for the cases that it is capable of doing, delivering on. Not for the cases that it cannot. Secondly, we need to upgrade the governing legislation, bearing in mind that the corruption in the 21st century is not the corruption that we have documented. It mutates and it mutates every day that digital economy gets deeper and deeper and cross-border transactions become a lot easier to do. And the third and possibly the most important from my point of view, if what I submit to you is correct, then the third complementary element is not to put NPA and these things as we are busy with it and it will take 10 years or five years and these things take time. Of course those things take time. But there are things that we have to do now in the next month or six months and 12 months so that we can reestablish the viability of our state, which means we need to have a parallel process. Whilst we are doing those long-term architectural redesign and upgrade, we got to have a political intervention as a national campaign, not as a partisan political campaign in order to bring to account the private sector players who have been at the heart of stealing our constitutional democracy. We can still do it, but it requires a different kind of campaign, a different type of political leadership, and it requires a different type of national, not partisan leadership. We cannot let A and B and B, Hitachi, SAP, banks that have been involved, law firms that have been involved, KPMG and others get away with it and get to a point, and this is really a slap in the face of us, that at the moment, Bain and Co. is taking National Treasury to court for boycotting them. Look how brazen they've become. To me, this is insane. And equally insane that the private sector gives Bain and Co. still business in this country. After all that we have had, because be discussing in this style as if it's a normal situation, a normal mistake has happened, somebody has done misjudgment, somebody has been uh, uh, greedy, misled, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is absolute of the where we should be. That's where I would like to end it and we can discuss more. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Most of them. <laughs> um, Claire, the idea of legislative reform, um, it's a tricky one because I'm still not sure about whether the assertion is that the laws don't exist at all or whether the institutions that have to administer those laws don't have the capacity. So until a few weeks ago, you and I labored falsely under the impression that if you have foreign currency, you have to declare it within a particular period until the Reserve Bank says, well, just call it imperfect and then you're fine. <laughs> So the law exists, we understood that the law existed, but when it came to it having to be applied, suddenly there was an alternative interpretation of what that is. In relation to the NPA in particular, I mean, the law, the laws are there, and yet we don't see the prosecution. Is it a question of capacity, or do we still have laws that quite simply aren't fit for purpose relation, in relation to the type of problems that we're trying to fix? Where's the problem? That's too hard, hmm. I don't know but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, there are a lot of laws there that would address what Zondo recommended. Um, the people that have been listed, um, Prasa, for example, there are, I think, at least 15. Um, and again, you could track this through the, through the, through the past Prasa papers that were filed. Um, there is overwhelming evidence, forensic, you name it, that exists. Um, there is no gap in the law. Um, that would prevent you from prosecuting those offences. They, common law offences, some of them are statutory, but they exist. Um, the legislative reform that I would posit needs addressing is, is in, in relation to, to 
consultants and, and perhaps PR firms. Multinationals that engage in sort of large-scale engagement with, with, with the public sector. And unlike other regulatory bodies, there's no complaints mechanism. So we're in the dark as to what happens. I think that's a gap. In relation to, to offences that need to be prosecuted, those are well-established at law. I don't think we need to create any new ones. I think any talk of that is really just a distraction from capacitating the NPA to do admittedly is very, very, the very difficult work of prosecuting complex, sometimes transnational economic crime. It's a complicated task. But if I can bring us back to Prasa, the forensics were all there. I don't know what the holdup is. And I would like, it is my hope that the, that the NPA and the DPCI would bring us into their confidence and explain what the holdup is. I mean, they've explained a certain amount and they were very clear three years ago that they were almost done. But three years ago is a long time. Yeah, you know, I'm not a legal person, thank God. So I can tell you how confused people like me get when we hear just how complicated the machinations of the law can be, for example. So if you look at the SIU, the SIU goes to Parliament and says, this was the issue, this is how we dealt with it, and these are the people that are held accountable. There's some sense of linearity between the effort they put in and the outcomes that they have. And yet it seems that they actually don't have the power to actually wake up and say, there's an issue at Prasa, let's go and tackle it. They have to rely on something called a proclamation, which seems that the discretion rests on those in power to decide that I think that's worth investigating, and I think the NPA must stick with that one. And of course, when the NPA sticks with that one, we all know what that means. I'm confused about that particular, I don't know, is it an overlap, is it a vacuum? What exactly does the legal architecture say? So in a case like Prasa, for example, if you're asked you today, who has dropped the ball? If there's answers the NPA, I'm not gonna be happy with that because I should be saying, well, the SIU seems to know what, they do, what to do. Why aren't they doing it? Well, the SIU established in the Special Tribunals Act is, is not capacitated or not authorized to institute criminal prosecutions. They can um, they institute civil proceedings for the recovery of funds stolen. And that's a very sort of um, basic... Only if the president says they must. Well, the president has already said they must. Hmm. That, that's fine. Um, when it comes to, to criminal prosecutions, they then can refer to be at the DPCI or, or the NPA. Where I do agree that there is a lot of confusion is the referral mechanisms. And this has come to light again in the, in the NPA bill, which establishes jurisdiction over crimes, which are actually not as crimes established in law. Um, but those, that jurisdiction bears no referral relationship or, or any other relationship to the role of the DPCI, the SIU, um, and uh, the SAPs. There is um, very, very um, opaque systems of referral that exist. This could be cleared up very easily in policy. Um, it just isn't. I, I'm sensing there's a dual paralysis there. So net, no, there's no single institution that has all the powers. So everybody's got a limitation. And there's also, there's no single institution that has all the capacity. So holistically, it sounds like the sum of everything else is to simply say, we're actually never gonna get this thing solved. One person says, my scope is limited to this. We saw that classic uh, case in the Palapala uh, uh, saga, where everybody says, oh no, no, my responsibility is to look at t two pages. The other seven pages are somebody else's. So by the time everybody had said they issued a report, we actually had no idea what had happened, except for the fact that the cows or the buffalo still hadn't left. That's all I know about Palapala. Kaya, the NPA always has the power to, to prosecute. It also has the power to suggest that there be an investigation. And I would argue that the NPA has, has a lot of work to do. And it's not about pointing fingers. It's about whether they are structurally enabled to do that. And that's where we need a, little, a bit more collective buy-in. Iraj, hey, when people then write and say, well, it looks like the NPA is sitting idle, there may be some obviously the criticism that comes from those that wanted to remain idle, and there may be legitimacy to people saying, well, in December 2017, Marcus Eustat did something. It's been six years. Surely the NPA must know how to react to that. So that sense of paralysis may indeed be a question of capacity, but surely there's also questions to be asked about the willingness to even look like they're taking these issues. I think with the greatest respect, we need to uh, put in context that if we want NPA and for that matter, European equivalent of NPA, to deal with these issues, we barking of the wrong tree. NPA tells us they haven't got the capacity. They haven't got the forensic accounting. They haven't got digital forensic. They don't have all that it takes to track down 
within the existing legislation. And if we want to capacitate them, it will take 10 years, assuming that those in power stay on track and mm. not change their mind and change their names and games and all that stuff. So uh, we're dealing with the cross-section of politics, institutional capacity building, and economics impact, social impact. And I think this is where we should, uh, with the greatest respect, expect from NPA what the NPA can deliver. Mm. And if it takes three years to give it other capacity, we need to give it the budget openly, with commitment, three years, build this capacity. Identify what new capacity you need. In the meantime, let's expect them what they can do. Otherwise, we're setting, up, setting them up to fail, which is exactly what the criminals want. The more we, we undermine the legitimacy, the stature of NPA, the more we are encouraging brazen corruption. So I think we need to, with the greatest respect, be mindful <laughs> that this is what the impact is on the business. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't mean that NPA should not be with haste capacitated. It does not mean this legislation should be with haste upgraded, uh, enabled, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but sometimes even the good accidents seem to not be capitalized on. So a good accident is that in Prasa, well, somebody did the forensic work for them. Mm -hmm. At Transnet, somebody did the forensic work for them. At Steinhoff, somebody did the forensic work for them. Even at VBS, the forensic work was mm -hmm. done. So even if I have to accept that they've got capacity constraints, there have been some of these low-hanging fruit where the hard work has been done. If every other institution in the financial reporting ecosystem has already pronounced guilt on Marcus Houston and said there was insider trading here, I'm struggling to see what it is that this additional work that the NPA has to conceptualize from, con uh, from inception and then meet these particular hurdles that hasn't been done. What's going on? Yeah, exactly my question. I'm not a lawyer and I really do not know, uh, have no idea. Uh, NPA must answer that and that is a strategic mapping of case management from a purely business strategy point of view. If I was business manager, I'd say, look, do this, do that, do that, because it's the closest to, to results and building the capacity. I do not know. For me, I, I, in every opportunity I get, I use Marcus Houston Marcus because uh, his chairman, Wissak, said, the board said, uh, what else do you want? Just <laughs> bring them in and get the man and, and, and lock him up. But he also got lawyers. Uh, he's got stolen money that he's happily spending it on, on whoever he has to spend. And that is where, with the greatest respect, we need to revise our, our laws, governing laws, not to put so much legal traps in so that senior counsel can find a way out. Mm. Uh, and that I think we must discuss earlier, that we need to upgrade the legislation to fit for purpose. At the moment, it's fit, fit for Loot, loot smartly, and nobody will catch you. That's scary. Claire, the idea of deterrence for errant behavior, do we not have enough, or do people simply think, well, even if I get caught, what is the likelihood that anyone's ever going to successfully prosecute me? And unfortunately, we've seen evidence of this where the, 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 you know, the, 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 the Hollywood-style arrest, they get there, they take Zandile Kumet, and you're like, surely they must have a solid case by this time. And then a year later, she's like, that case is so weak, I'm going to walk into the parliamentary legislature. And she does, she becomes an MPL. And then two years later, oh, sorry, the, doc the documents that were going to be used to prosecute her have now disappeared in a flood. So you look at all of these things, you're thinking, wait, hold on, by the time you executed on that Hollywood-style arrest, what exactly did you have behind you? And we see, was it the Nulane case in relation to Estina, mm -hmm. where suddenly we thought, finally, somebody's going to get something on the Guptas, and when it got there, everyone was like, oh, dear God, this is embarrassing. It was embarrassing. Um, and, I, and I think, look, I think there are plenty of Hollywood-type arrests that occur with a very incomplete docket. Mm. And I think that is deeply irresponsible. What I, what I don't want the discourse to be about is whether or not we want the NPA to do X, Y, or Z. We want crime to stop. That includes economic crime. If that is the case, what does that? Well, we know that it's the surety of conviction. If that is the case, if, that, what, if that's what deterrence requires, then it's not about whether we want the NPA to do something, it's about the fact that the NPA has to do it, because that's what deterrence requires. I'm alive to, 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 the, to the various complexities around the capacity of the NPA, but we can't lose focus on the project of capacitating or fixing it, of, of listening to, to the DPPs when they say they can't do X, Y, and Z. 
But as you say, a lot of the evidence, particularly in, in relation to Prasa and the, and the forensics, was handed to them on a platter. And again, um, the silence on that score is deafening. Iraj, hey, if we are to accept that the state in its current form is never going to put enough resources to these agencies, whether they don't want to because they know what the consequences are, or whether because legitimately resources don't exist, does that then bolster the case for saying, well, private resources do exist and private resources can be mobilized? We've seen it in the Solidarity Fund. We've seen it in the National Energy Crisis Committee. We're about to see it in Transnet, and I can predict that we're about to see it in water, and I can go on and on and on. So private resources do exist. But obviously, there's serious tension points that emerge as soon as private resources then take this place, displace the state, because, well, in the case of BLSA, for example, you can get resources from them only to discover that one of their members is banned, that they've onboarded. <laughs> Would you still prosecute them? Is there a case to be made for mobilizing resources? Um, yes, but not through what, what is now commonly get the private sector to have a solidarity fund and all that. Because what are you doing? You're taxing the good guys to let the bad guys get away with it. No, you got to get the money from those who are the bad guys who have stolen. Because that's what we're doing. Uh, and, and I've had this discussion with the BLSA in the open discussion. What the, guys, what the hell are you doing? Join forces with the government to bring the corporates who've looted to pay back compensation, reparation, whatever they have to pay. Don't do it the way that you want to say, okay, the rail has to be done and our coal are piling up, let, let's get the rail going. Then you're creating the secondary problem. It becomes a problem of are you buying the, the agencies to get your export going, but you don't care about hospitals that people are dying in, and the schools that are not getting quality education. So we, we then become fighting amongst ourselves, which is exactly what the guys want. Those who were stolen, they want to find ways of us fighting with each other, as opposed to saying, damn it, you were, you were stolen from all of us, black, white, male, female, young, and old. We're going to join forces to get it back. Resources should be raised and should be raised in the next eight to 12 months. But from not private sector, full stop, private sector has been party to stealing the, our money, decapacitating our economy. Hmm. Yes, we must raise it. So where should we get the resources? Sorry? Where should we get the resources now? From those who have admitted they've been party to this uh, looting, they have admitted we are, not, we are no longer hypothesizing McKenzie has admitted, A and B has admitted, Hitachi has admitted, SAP has paid a penalty in the United States for the, for the state looting participation. They didn't pay us, they paid in the United States because those authorities were on the ball and they got it within three weeks. We, six years later, we talk about it and we're fighting amongst ourselves. So I think we need to uh, ask the question differently and the answer would be very different. If we stay the space that we are and ask the questions that we are asking ourselves, the answers will be the type of answers that we discuss and it gets us nowhere. Claire, your views on the resource pr dimensions? I agree it's a constraint. Um, but I'm going to bring us back to the point that there is a lot of low-hanging fruit, that a lot of the work has been done. Mm. And I, I think the public deserve answers as to why we haven't seen charges, prosecutions, and convictions. Somebody must answer that. Unfortunately, the NPA is not on the stage. We're going to come to the floor now and ask for some of your inputs on some of these questions. Mr. Desai's hand was first, and I see Mr. Lewis here. Um, and there's uh, two more hands on the side, in that order. Oh. Oh, okay. Here we are now. <laughs> First time there. Allow me quickly to stand up because where I come from, you don't speak to the elders sitting down. <laughs> Until and or unless we have the guts and the spirit, we saw when Amapoko Poko smash and grab the match from England, we will never beat corruption. <laughs> to an ordinary guy in the township, in the informal settlement, in the farm, in the village, 
perception is everything. When we are influential, you're a top guy, we are well known, you are not guilty until proven guilty. When you are an ordinary guy in the street, you are guilty, arrested, and probably deny bail until you prove yourself not guilty. Soon we will be narrators and commentators of corruption because almost the same thing we spoke about last year, we're speaking about them today, and same thing we'll be addressing next year. Before I sit down, where I grew up, we used to play soccer in front of our neighbor's yard, and there was a dog that was inside the yard, and it was always barking. I was afraid one day this dog will come out of the yard, and I don't know what was going to happen to us. Unfortunately, someday someone left the gate open. Before we knew it, the dog was amongst us, and we only realized that all the time the dog was barking to play with us. It, also, it only wanted to have fun. It was chasing the ball. This institution, your NPA that you're mentioning, if they're not arresting every, anyone, they are barking because they, just to be, they want to be part of the fun. So give us why, your name just why, before you start. Why must we keep on using our taxpayers when they can't arrest and prosecute anyone? Okay, your name? Ali Kule from Outer, but today I came here as an independent activist. All right, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, the second hand was right in front here. I always thought the smashing grab analogy was unfortunate. I think Scrum Capture captures it better. Scrum Capture. <laughs> <laughs> This session has been long on rhetoric, but, but very short on analysis of corporate corruption, which is what I thought the session was about. And, uh, you know, as I say, great on NPA bashing, but not very uh, informative on what the cor corporates have done under state capture. Um, uh, Tongart and, and Steinhoff, as much as I would like to see Marcus Yost in jail as much as anybody else, but those are not state capture cases. Those, those are, are vanilla uh, fraud, corporate fraud cases. They're not, they're not state capture cases. And when you think of the corporates that are named in the state, in the, in the Zondor Commission, look at, look at all of them that immediately come to mind. Bain, McKinsey, KPMG, uh, SAP, uh, China Rail, uh, the South African corporate sector actually comes out quite well. I don't see any discovery or Sassel or any of the, the big mining companies. The, the only South African homegrown companies that appear in, this, in the Zondo Commission report were those that were set up to be corrupt. There was the, the Guptas, uh, Trillion, um, Bosasa. These were companies whose business model was corruption. And I don't think the South African corporate sector should feel uh, tarred by the experience of those South African firms. But where, where is there any mention in the Zondo Commission of, of the South African corporate sector? Uh, maybe they were clever enough to escape it, but they certainly escaped it very well because they're all either international companies or companies that were set up, uh, as I say, to, to be corrupt. So, so, so how does the South African corporate sector emerge out of this? So that's the, the one comment that I, that I wanted to make. The, the, the question I wanted to ask is, what, what is the... Is the consequence of finding a corporate, a juristic person guilty of a crime? I, I ask this question, I, I, it's not a rhetorical question, I don't, I don't know the answer to it. I mean, McKinsey go out of their way to avoid a criminal finding against itself. And um, although I agree with you, they got away with absolute murder here in paying back their, their fee, for which they were actually lauded by the Zondo Commission. Um, you know, I didn't realize that the Zondo Commission had found that they, uh, that further investigation 
is needed because in the in the verbal exchange between uh, um, uh, the, the evidence leader Zondo and uh, and the McKinsey uh, witness, they were told that they were in, they were the exemplar of of good corporate conduct. So I think it's the one blot on the Zondo Commission's uh, 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 the quality of the report is that they didn't see that what what McKinsey had done. But there are situations, like in the, in the United States around the Purdue Pharmaceutical case, where they go out of their way to pay what even for them are large amounts of money, yeah. a billion dollars, to, to, to avoid a criminal finding. So wh what is it that they're trying to avoid? Is it a reputational problem? Is it a regulatory problem? Or, or, or is it that it is easier to put the executives or the corporate officers in prison because a finding of criminality has been made against the corporation. So if you can't jail the corporation, what is the impact of a, of a finding of a juristic, finding that a juristic person who you can't put in jail is guilty of a, of a crime? All right, thank you, David. Uh, there was another hand at the back. and I'm the investigating director. Uh, so the NPA is not on the panel up there. I am in the house, slightly confused, um, because when I looked at my program, it talked about corporate capture and private sector accountability. And unfortunately, session three was literally an NPA bashing. Be that as it may, I take everything the panelists say. There are many of those matters where you have legitimate criticisms. I can't deal with them only because they're just not in my direct ambit of work, but I, like I did earlier, of course I'm going to take them back, and I'm going to give back those words both the panelists used, whether it is about Marcus Euster, it is about Prasa, it is with McKenzie, that's in my space, and yes, we deal with that. But we will go back and, and look at that, and those criticisms are welcome. What is somewhat daunting and difficult is this comment, Claire. I think it is highly irresponsible dangerous and untrue to say as follows, that the whole NPA top structure is appointed by the president, so one has to ask, aren't they then beholden to the president? That is wrong. The head of the SIU said, as he was introduced as well, he's also appointed by the president. The head of the SIU has said, he sources his work from the president by way of proclamation. Does that make him beholden? No, it doesn't nor does it make the top structure of the NPA because we have to do our work, and I can tell you we do our work, and if you have evidence to the contrary, please bring it to the fore, that we are beholden to the president because we cannot be. And what I want to say is in terms of the work that I've had to do as the investigating director, I've not received any directives, either from the president or the minister of justice. So in terms of our operational independence, we have been allowed operational independence. I just wanted that clarity. But also to say, and I was being cheeky with Kavisha sitting next to me, we also have NACAC. Who appointed you? The president? But I know for a fact they're going to execute their mandate independently, fairly, properly, through all the right processes. And all I'm saying is, every criticism that was given I take it to heart and we will deal with it. I just worry sometimes if there's a specific narrative and we don't deal with that narrative, then that's the narrative that stands. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, we had another hand here. The last one. Thanks. Um, I'm Wendy Orr from the Anti-Corruption Coalition, and I'm also going to bring it squarely back into the corporate sector because I worked for a very large corporate um, from 2011 to 2022. And we procured services from a large number of the organizations most prominently implicated um, in, in state capture. Bain, SAP, EOH, McKinsey, KPMG, I mean, you know, could go on and on. And in response, we applied what I thought was a rather arbitrary set of criteria to decide whether we should, you know, fire the, the organization that was providing us with services or, or keep them on. Um, and at the end of the day, we only decided that we would fire Bain. I mean, KPMG were our auditors and we kept them on. Um, so I suppose my question is, what is the role of corporates within the corporate sector in, in 
punishing, holding to account those organisations that were um, implicated in state capture. Is there a role? And if so, what is it? Okay, that's cool. Uh, we'll take another round, but we'll address these ones first. So I think perhaps, uh, David, my view on why it seemed that it was the international firms that are far more prominent in the conversation is that a lot of the people that went shopping for partners, for private sector partners to engage them in these nefarious activities, understood very well the value of these blue chip labels. So if you had said that it was Kaya Auditors Incorporated versus saying that it was Deloitte Incorporated that you're bringing together as a partner, you're likely to be seen to be more legitimate here of those international partners. So of course, what also became quite clear is that these international partners wanted to score state contracts. And if they then started believing that the rules are that you have to partner with these particular entities, otherwise you don't stand a chance, they did it. We saw from McKinsey's contract with Trillion is that they accepted that. They said that this is the way business is done in Africa, for example. So that meant that local firms were actually displaced in the conversation. They were not able to access contracts. And this created and extended the veneer of legitimacy because it was the blue chip uh, firms that were participating in this. So a lot of people anecdotally 10 or 15 years ago if you say that oh we as a state have partnered with Deloitte or KPMG they would have said oh you've partnered with a very strong partner you know people who know what they're doing so you don't immediately think who the hell are they so it's easy to interrogate me you easy to assume that I don't have ca capacity but you don't make the same assumptions about a Deloitte or a KPMG so that actually buys them a lot of leeway into get embedded into this particular state contract so that's one element of it I think there's also a very clear problem that exists in that until state capacity exists, these entanglements between private sector players and the state are going to be there. And what I mentioned earlier on is that unfortunately it does create an opening for those that want to then onboard on the basis of this contract to then engage in the forest activities to see that as an entry point. And once they've seen that as an entry point, then it's actually, you know, um, it's manna from heaven for them. So I do think that that's probably one of the things that influenced why it was really those big international firms that seem to have been leading the race towards that. The smaller South African firms were unfortunately displaced in, in, in part of the conversation. So those are just some of the, uh, 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 the ideas that I thought I would share about that. There's also the big problem that you raise about, so what happens if a corporate I I is found to be guilty? Because you cannot jail a corporate. And maybe you and I want to see someone in orange uniforms, but you're not going to see a corporate in, in, in an orange uniform. What we see happening is that they always say, but that person is no longer with us. So Deloitte says, oh, the people that engage in those contracts with ESCOM, they no longer work here. So we're simply going to pay the money and then everybody must move on. And I don't know if we have enough instruments to say, no, hold on. This person was only in a position to do that on the basis or on the backing that you gave him as a corporate entity. So you're equally accountable for their conduct. So when it comes to Vikash at, uh, at McKinsey, he's gone. Mazzoni at Bain, he disappeared from the country. And Bain says, well, we cannot find him. He's somewhere there. So we definitely still have problems in relation to that. But I'd like the other panelists to respond to the questions that have been raised. We'll start with Claire. Sure. I, I think I can respond to the second part of Mr. Lewis's question, which was about holding juristic entities accountable. Um, I, I think that the nuts and bolts of piercing the veil um, exist within the existing, within the, the legislation that exists, the Companies Act and its associated regulations and so on. Um, the tools exist to pierce that corporate veil. They have for a while. Um, they're detailed and they're complex, but they certainly do exist and that's, um, it's a veil that has been pierced in, um, in many instances before. Um, and Ms. Johnson, um, you know, my use of the word, word beholden, um, I, I apologize if it's offensive, but I would respond with two points. One, the ND, there hasn't been an NDPP that has completed its tenure or two been mired in controversy until hopefully to date. Yeah, I think on the issue, uh, the fact is, and we cannot deny that as we sit here, all those who were named and shamed and some of them who paid, they're still doing as they are doing now. Except that, as I mentioned, it has just mutated. It's not as it was. And some of them, and all of them, and this is an important point for me, they are replicating their learnings here, the rest of Africa. And they pay when they get caught, like our coal company, they pay the penalties in London and in New York, not in Africa. They steal from DRC, but the penalty goes to the Treasury of United States or UK. In our case, I've mentioned three of the 
uh, named and shamed entities who are still in the country. They have been fined and they paid their fines of 70 million US, 18 million US, and 52 million US to the American Treasury. I asked the question, what's going on? You steal from us, you destroy our infrastructure of the economy and the society, but somebody else gets the reward. We need to deal with this, which means the National Treasury got to have a piece of legislation, sign whatever protocol they have to sign with these um, uh, stock exchanges that when they are caught, there is at least either the full amount comes here or half of it comes here or some or other terms or the, the right compensation comes, not just the amount that's stolen. And this is where we, we in my view, and my, my apology if I'm irritating some of you, we are sleep, snoozing through the job completely by having a wrong conversation. The discourse has to be if SAP, who's paid the penalty, if KPMG, who's admitted and paid the pittance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, all of them who've been named and none of them has denied. Bring them to a room and say, guys, you want to do business in this country? These are terms and conditions. Juristic individual, we can't put you in jail, but we can have, and this is the nature of the market economy. You regulate the market economy. You cannot leave it the way they are. And you bring this business South Africa together and say, what is your rationale for steel? Despite all that has damage been done, I, for my liking, unfortunately, or for my sins, I have these discussions privately with the CS. So how on earth do you justify, as a South African uh, entity, your revenue comes from here, your people are here, you know this entity has stolen and done the damage, and you're still happy to employ them. All that they'll do, they'll rip you off in a different way. Plain and simple. McKenzie was not the first time caught in South Africa. McKenzie got 18 different cases from the United States to every jurisdiction that they've done. It's systemic to their nature. If, what, who are we fooling? We, like, uh, we, we definitely like foreign capital. We, we want foreign businesses to, to help us grow and to grow us. And, but we don't want the wrong type. They are not here to do what they say they do. The only thing that they do now at the moment they force our good businesses, good corporates, to pay extra taxes in the form of uh, special arrangements. And then you and I come and say, but this is a uh, wrong way mm. to break our society apart. Mm. Uh, we are right because they want us to, to have a fight amongst ourselves. So I think we need to elevate the debate, in my view. It doesn't mean that NPA uh, shouldn't improve. It should. It shouldn't mean that we mustn't upgrade, but we mustn't sit and allow those who have caused the damage to get away with it in the name of we want foreign capital, we are short of capital. And believe me, when you get rid of the rotten capital, the real good capital will come. Because we are not short of opportunities. We mustn't feel sorry for ourselves. We have opportunities, we have projects, but we need to set the right legislation to attract the right type of foreign skills and foreign capacity. At the moment, to the best of my judgment, the, the, the focus of our discussion is a bit warped. Um, we're putting too much emphasis on long term, which we should do, and there is no doubt about it, but we letting go of those who have their, our belongings in their hand, and we doing nothing about them. We need to do something, of, that is where the short term money should come, that's where the short term uh, resources should be raised, and unless we raise the sufficient resources in the current fiscal conditions that we have, we will not have sufficient long-term money to commit to rebuild NPA, to rebuild SARS, to rebuild um, um, ESCOM, Transnet, ports, you name it. The government, as we sit here, is talking about cutting, 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 as if this is the way to rebuild, mm. in instead of <laughs> recovering the stolen resources. That's my submission. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think the big, big concern for me is 
whether we've got enough accountability mechanisms for the private sector. So you mentioned the management consulting firms, for example, and the PR firms, in that when it comes to state actor players, we sort of know what the legislation that underpins the work that they should be doing is. So therefore, when somebody does something wrong, you can either cite the PFMA or any other act. So there seems to be some element of accountability mechanisms there. How well we execute on them is a secondary matter. But when it comes to the private sector players that are instrumental in helping the state execute on some of its contracts, I'm worried that the accountability mechanisms quite simply are not there. What should we be putting together? I mean, that's a, it's, a, it's a complex question to answer. Um, but I think we can look to other jurisdictions that do have regulatory components that exist, um, and some of them exist very effectively. Um, and I think we can look to them. And I mean, I, I don't want to go into, de you know, we don't have time to go into detail about that, what, about what that kind of legislation will look like, but it, it exists. Um, and to the extent that we don't have it, I, um, I don't think it's controversial to, to insist that it must be established. I mean, we, we can, th there are failings within the, uh, obvious failings within um, URBA, um, within, the, uh, within the operations of the LPC, um, but that shouldn't detract us um, from the project of establishing accountability mechanisms um, for large-scale multinational corporations, consultancies that simply, you know, we glide through the, the corporate and, and, and public space without there being any form of, of, of method of, of, of being able to address complaints. Yeah. Uh, does that result in us giving us instru institutions like the NPA more instruments to actually do these things? Absolutely, and also it should give us the, the appropriate legislation if it means the, the type of uh, measures like a special courts, a special um, a speedy type of treatment of or management of these cases. And I also want to use this opportunity. It's not unique to hear that corporates have committed corruption. A few years back, back Siemens, the major German company, got involved in a massive corruption case, uh, right? Uh, how did the German government deal with it? Within weeks, they brought them around the table and I was at that time involved in a different way. Uh, we had interest in that, and I was on a board of, of Munich Re, that some of you might know, as a reinsurer. It wasn't a question of years and months, a question of weeks. You close it down or tell us how you're going to do it. it the question that must take you to the court and the judge must ju No, you're causing damage to the economy, to the country. There, is, there are different ways of dealing with it. So I think that's what I meant by saying we're treating it an unusual situation in a usual way. We want to socialize everybody, normalize. It, it, we really haven't been hit by a normal corruption. And let's not treat it normal. Let's say, okay, what, what is the abnormality that we were hit with? What are our options? And that's the German government, the German authorities, within three weeks sorted out the, the, the fiasco that Siemens had. Because of its consequences for the, for the, for the German economy, for the brand. We learn from that. Those people are still alive. Bring them around the table, whether it's through government, whether it's through National Treasury or NPA, and sit them in a room, I tell you, they'll give you the, the options. And uh, unless we do that, we're going to, at the moment, when I walk in the business circles and corporate sectors, all of them are convinced that no matter what they do, nothing will happen. Why? Because, and uh, distinguished judges are sitting here, uh, you cannot have a partisan justice system. You cannot have a guilty politician walking the, the streets and then go after a guilty CEO. You cannot have a, a high-level uh, crook <laughs> who everybody knows getting away with it and then you go after that. You, you, you're segmenting this justice system. So we need to think through that and rebuild our infrastructure all over again. But the right question should be asked because each one of them requires a different type of measures. Rebuilding NPA, getting the long-term uh, fit-for-purpose legislation, these things will take three to five to seven years. In the meantime, how are we going to run the show? How are we going to keep the society together? How are we going to, to pay for schools and, 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 and hospitals and macroeconomic stability? Yeah. That's my issue. All right. We'll take one last round of questions from the floor and also questions from the online platform if they are ready. We're going to start uh, from this side and then move in that direction. Oh, and then end up there. 
Oh, the mic is already there. How? Okay. okay. Yeah, I, thanks. Mr. Desai. The, thanks, Kaya. The, uh, don't we have a problem with our financial architecture? I know it's, uh, it's increasingly internationalized and there's an international dimension to it, but, uh, you know, a heist of this scale could have never happened, surely, if we had a financial regulation in place and we didn't have all these uh, uh, jurisdictions where you, you are so cloudy and so on, Dubai and the shelf companies, HSBC and so on and so forth. So I know the, and I think the, an additional problem is the blurring of the private and the public sphere. So we have these regulation agencies left, right and centre, uh, but they're increasingly staffed by people from inside those industries. Um, it's, it's maybe another point I'd, I'd, I'd like to just, uh, get your comments on. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, thanks, Kaya. So my your name, please. Uh, oh. Please introduce yourself. Sorry, I'm Kavisha Pele. I'm at Corruption Watch and the NACAC. My comment or question relates to the way in which we are financing politics at the moment which to my mind will always enable capture, be it regulatory in policy or where um, there's a sort of quid pro quo arrangement where tenders are provided to those who are funding political parties. And this is not a unique problem to South Africa. I think you know, all over the world, the way corporates are funding politics and democracy is an expensive exercise, so it does need money. But that influence of money in our politics does enable capture at all levels. And Dr. Iraj, you were talking about the short-term solution. So we do, have regulate, we do have legislation that regulates political party funding, but you know, there's constant comments and threats to weaken this legislation and weaken the transparency mechanisms there. And what that means is that even though we'll have the best NPA and we'll have really good criminal justice agencies and we'd fix all of this stuff from a reactive perspective, but the way in which money is influencing decisions and the way in which you know, that interaction between uh, the, quid pro, sorry, the quid pro quo relationships, we're actually not going to deal with the systemic levels of corruption. So just uh, you know, some of your thoughts on, on how we, we start to confront these issues. All right, thank you. There were a couple of hands here. Yeah? Judge, OK. Hi, um, I'm reading a question from the online Q&A from Pops. He says, should we be pursuing class action lawsuits against the likes of Bain, McKinsey, KPMG, Bank of Baroda, and others? I have no doubt this will send a clear signal to corporate executives who may want to engage in such activities in the future. I, I want to clear up a misunderstanding. We're talking about corporate corruption and corporate criminality. A corporation is a th theoretical concept. It is people who are corrupt through a corporation. The, those people can be prosecuted while they're in control of the corporation or thereafter. They commit the crime, they use the corporation as a vehicle to do so. You could convict both. You could hammer the corporation financially and you can certainly give the dishonest controllers of the corporation orange uniforms. Thank you, Judge. Uh, there were two other hands that I noticed there. Okay. Um, I'm uh, Anne McLennan. I'm a consultant and a visiting person at the Witt School of Governance. Um, I, I, I think that uh, partly, and I think Iraj is hinting at it, a, a lot of these issues are, are, are a result of trying to do development and democracy at the same time in, in a context of very scarce resources. But I think the other thing that we're missing in all these processes is, is the politics of it. In other words, the flow of power and, and, and relationships 
that sustain a lot of those those relationships. And um, and 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 what worries me is in the same way as sort of setting up a, a unit to investigate something is a way of of, of depoliticizing an issue, saying we need legislative reform or all of those kinds of things is in a way deferring deferring the issue. We we keep saying, oh look, we're doing something, but it's going to take a bit of time. And I, I think we need to find a way to talk to each other, as you suggest, that actually allows us to listen to and work together, because we don't do that. The, the, the South African pathology is to blame, and I think that's part of our apartheid legacy culturally, or we pass it up or down, or we pass it to the side, but it's all of our responsibility, actually, to solve this. And if it means that we have to set up a special body that will prosecute the people who are involved in state capture, then that's what we should do. But that will require political will, but also the will of the people. And, uh, and that's a tall ask, I think. So it's more of a comment than a, a, a question, but yeah. All right, thank you. I think that was the last hand that side. Mr. Oh, Mungseni um, and then Mr. Mabuso. Thanks, I'm um, Bongseni Butelezi from Pari. Um, I think, I mean, it's a, a variation of a question that's been asked, but I want to ask it more crudely, Iraj. Um, how do we break through the politics? I think the, 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 the politics question, um, w w everything that you say needs to be done, and the way we need to elevate the debate is compelling. But when we can't even arrive at the same understanding of what the problem is, partly because those corporations we're talking about are able to spin the narrative right, and make it very difficult um, for the ordinary person to actually understand what the issue is. Right? Uh, and then we've got, uh, on top of that, Twitter, um, uh, and I want to talk about that a little bit in my closing comments later, um, where the narrative quickly spins out of control and becomes something completely different. But also when you have people who are significant, very powerful political players, being involved in spinning those false narratives. How do we break through that to be able to do something as singular as what the German government, in the example you gave, was able to do, when they, even our own cabinet can't agree on what the problem is? All right, Mr. Mavuso. I think people have been saying this, um, and I've almost kept quiet because I thought they were coming up with it, but. What brings us together here is really a crisis of, of leadership, uh, of ethical leadership. Zondo came about because leaders became corrupt and all of that. I think the question then we must ask is, how did that happen? Was it inevitable that at a certain time people would become corrupt? You could blame the systems or the attribute it to the cleverness of the people or how to... I think we should also take cognizance of the fact that we are a product of our history. Uh, a group of people who were oppressed, or movement that was oppressed, in this case the ANC, produced a leadership which by association with the ANC gained a lot of respect from the people. Um, so we have a system here where this party was extremely popular, that's why it got the majority of votes the people were not elected directly at constituency level. They were elected by association with the important people in this good party. Um, so, so I see somewhere there a question of uh, the question of, uh, I don't think if you change the political system into constituents or anything, it would solve all the problems. Indeed, you are saying that uh, in in countries like um, other countries, United States and so on, this corruption is quite rampant. But there is, uh, this is not a very sexy thing, a need really to um, raise the level of understanding, the education of, of the electorate. Uh, it's going to be very important to choose a leadership uh, based on uh, 
the, the attributes, the character of the people who lead. It's, it's a very difficult one because you associate people with a party, and, uh, and in our case, really, if, if I'm number 15 on the list, I'll end up in cabinet or something like that. It doesn't matter what else, and if my party is, is good. So I'm just saying, perhaps, point of my intervention is to say, we do need to do the hard task of voter education. In the end, you've got to teach, uh, assist people to elect people who have got credibility, character, education, and all the other things. It's voter all right. education. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, if Claire, you'd start with the responses, and then we'll move to your Raj. I think they're most for, mostly for Raj. I mean, I can speak to the. I'd like to speak to the class action question, yeah, and yeah. the answer. Uh, the simple answer is yes. It's tricky because defining a class in these circumstances is is obviously complex um, because it, we all suffered. So whether it's an opt-in or an opt-out would be would be difficult to you know to ascertain at this stage. But I think that there are clever actuaries out there who could make it work. Legal actuaries. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think our comments. I'm not going to comment on comments. Just very quickly, global financial systems. We have, in my view. Uh, we have a lot more to lose if we get out of it. That's an uh, integrated global financial system. More and more literally daily new instruments come in that if our legislation doesn't keep up with it, leakage will happen. Illicit financial flows are major issues at the moment. Quite frankly, as an economist with eye on a national uh, uh, macro picture, I'm now a lot more worried about the illicit financial flows because we haven't got the right legislation, the right system, and I'm, I'm split, but Zondo Commission also people have stolen our money. Where do I spend my energy? It's a big issue and requires a different, really, discussion. It's a huge issue, um, but there's nothing we can do at the moment. Uh, funding of political parties is important, but it's something that says architecture must be right. Uh, political parties, I have no problem who wants with whatever intention to support them as long as the procurement policy is also equally transparent so that we can see who gets what and why. The two sort of counterbalance each other. What we can't have is to have one of them but not the other one. Mm. And uh, therefore, democracy is complex. Uh, keeping democracy upgraded as we evolve is a big job, is a big task. And that's one of the elements of it is, uh, these are the evolving, growing complexities of democratic order, and we need to be alert to, uh, if you change one thing, you need to also make sure that the other pieces will uh, uh, hang together. Um, in terms of uh, action lawsuit uh, or uh, group uh, lawsuit, um, I'm personally not in favor of it, but we mustn't rule it out. In some cases, it does deliver, um, depending on the issue. If the issue becomes legalistic, we're going to lose. Be, by lose, I mean if, I'm, if something that comes in 10 years time, like the asbestos, then a generation of our youth are going to be without what they need to, to have to, to grow or our economy and so on. So we need to have a coordinated approach, which should be done by NPA, which should be done by a lawsuit, and what should be done through a political campaign, the way the Germans deal with the Siemens case. Um, and there is n no single template that will fit all the cases. Um, uh, very quickly, and the last one in terms of how do we break through the politics. Um, I think <laughs> Jonathan mentioned you, you get the government that you deserve. And we've come at a point in our history, the evolution of, and I'm not trying to be philosophical, very practical. And, uh, and uh, the wisdom of history also comes upon us that we have to do education that will take time. But we have come to a, to a moment in our evolution of our democratic order for the first time, I would submit, that we need to operate within the complexity of Twitter and X and all of that and social media and those who want to set the agenda for us. But then we need to have a team like this team and political leaders who are not here to have a genuine discussion to say this is the, the fork in the road. If you want to go the route that way, then don't complain that 
uh, you will only go one way. Don't blame the colonialists, don't blame history, don't blame bad luck, don't blame race and gender and everything else. It is your selection. Or let's do the hard work, which will require voter education, which require compensation from the, from the uh, guilty corporates, which will require upgrading the infrastructure for the long term, and keep an eye on the revision of the fit for purpose legislation that we need given in the 21st century. It's a tough job, yes. But if you think this is tough and expensive, <laughs> Behold the alternative. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I think our reality is that we quite simply don't have enough accountability mechanisms to hold the private sector accountable. And for as long as the private sector is going to be embedded into state contracting, perhaps we should be revisiting the model of how the state contracts with the private sector to ensure that maybe the rules of engagement are as clear so that we do not have to do a retrospective analysis of saying, oh dear God, something has gone wrong, because clearly those in the private sector do see the state as a fertile ground for lining their pockets. And that is something that greed, unfortunately, is a driving force behind behind it, and for as long as capitalism is driven by greed, I do not see a way out of it immediately. But thank you very much to my panelists. Um, it's a difficult conversation, as one would expect. But yeah, thank you, and we'll step off the stage now.